I'm Lynn Yackel from Vision 2020, and we are so excited to be here tonight uh, in the National Constitution Center where we first launched Vision 2020 in the year 2010. And when Rosemary and I come back after the wonderful program that, that Jeff Rosen has put together for our, for our, uh, pro our Congress, we're in the midpoint of our National Congress, um, after that, Rosemary and I will tell you many of the things that we're planning for the year 2020. But what I want to say now is that we are planning these things in collaboration with the National Constitution Center and the city of Philadelphia. And our mayor, Michael Nutter, has been a wonderful cheerleader for this plan from the very beginning. And he is here and he has agreed to be an honorary chair, a co-chair, of the Centennial Advisory Committee, which will be making all the plans to pre uh, present the national celebration of the 19th Amendment Centennial here in Philadelphia in the year 2020. So, thank you. So good evening, everyone, and uh, Lynn, thank you very, very much. I think everyone knows by now that if uh, Lynn asked you to be an honorary co-chair, uh, that uh, the first answer is uh, yes. And the second part of that is just do what she says. So, um, Lynn, thank you very, very much for your leadership on Vision 2020, and certainly uh, Rosemary, uh, the same. Um, I want to thank Jeff Rosen uh, for our uh, cooperative agreement, the great president here at uh, NCC. Jeff, thank you uh, very, very much. Our city representative is also a Vision 2020 delegate, Desiree Peter Bell, who's right there. Desiree, please give her a big round of applause. If you're wondering about the, the uh, extra nasal sound in my voice, I gave a little too much shouting at the uh, IBC uh, Blue, uh, Blue Cross uh, Broad Street run yesterday. So I'm working on, working on getting that back. Uh, another very strong, strong woman uh, in uh, this city, of course, is the president of Philadelphia Academies, who also happens to be my wife, Lisa Nutter, uh, who's right there. Lisa. I was going to uh, introduce uh -huh. Lisa. And her seatmate, of course, is a great businesswoman, Mary Doherty, the owner of Nicole Miller here in Philadelphia. Tonight, I have one of my favorite Nicole Miller ties on uh, this <laughs> evening. So um, uh, we're, uh, we're excited uh, to be a partner. And to all of the uh, women here who are uh, participating in this event and many, many others, one, thank you and congratulations. To the few uh, brave and strong men uh, who are here tonight, uh, can we give them a big, big round of applause as well? Philadelphia's diversity uh, is a part of our strength, and we're certainly one of the most diverse uh, cities in the United States of America. But there's still more work to be done, even with the centennial of uh, the 19th Amendment. And we need to make sure uh, that uh, women uh, increasingly uh, have the opportunity to be, whether it's in the boardroom, uh, access not only just to the voting booth, but to also get votes uh, and to serve uh, in public office. Uh, we all have access to the voting booth, uh, but we have not had equal access uh, to the ability to uh, reach a variety of local, state, and national offices. It was uh, here uh, four years, uh, six years ago, uh, that we witnessed, of course, one of the most historic debates uh, in the United States of America. It was he right here at the National Constitution Center, where Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton and Senator Barack Obama uh, had a uh, had a debate, and uh, Philadelphia, I think, was the beneficiary of that, and I think most people already know, but I'll reiterate, it is certainly my hope and expectation that very, very soon uh, we will have a woman uh, serving as president of the United States of America. So, I mean, not to be political about it, but, you know, um, in any event. Uh, I am very, very proud as the mayor of the fifth largest city in America uh, to uh, participate uh, in this effort, to be a part of uh, the sponsorship. And I want to reaffirm uh, certainly to, uh, to Lynn and Rosemary and all of you uh, that you will have every possible help and support and assistance uh, and commitment uh, from the city of Philadelphia to help launch uh, this effort and to make sure uh, that things get off to a great start. The city will be a fantastic partner, but it only really works because of what all of you do. Keep pushing us, keep inspiring us, but also keep doing the many great things that you do in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, in the United States of America, and, and I know for many of you around the world. We're a better place because of you. Thank you.
And now I have the great pleasure of turning this over to our host for the evening, who has also agreed to be an honorary co-chair of the Centennial Advisory Committee for the 19th Amendment. And I must tell you that since Jeff Rosen came here to the NCC, we have had some of the most energetic and optimistic and positive forward-looking conversations I can remember since we got started with Vision 2020. Jeff is a great ally, he's an expert, and he has put tonight's program together specifically in the middle of our National Congress. So all of these amazing women from all over the country who are here have the great benefit of hearing from Jeff and his wonderful panelists who are going to, I'm sure, tell us many things that we need to know. So Jeff Rosen, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Lynn. Welcome, uh, uh, everyone. I can't tell you how much I've been looking forward to this evening. It was, I think, my first week on the job at the National Constitution Center last June that Lynn and Rosemary came to see me, and they said, we've got a really exciting project. We want to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment in the year 2020, and we want to have panels each of the years leading up to that anniversary going forward. And I said, I can't think of anything I would rather do here at the National Constitution Center. The 19th Amendment is at the center of some of the most cutting edge and exciting constitutional debates in this country today. Uh, scholars are using it to rethink the meaning of gender equality and a whole range of issues at the center of national life. And the history is being reexamined. And I think we can just get together a dream team panel, the best historians and legal scholars in the country who can teach us about the history and contemporary significance of the 19th Amendment. And that is precisely what we have done tonight. We have literally the top historian and legal scholars in the country about the history and contemporary significance of the 19th Amendment, and we have a tremendous amount to learn from them. So I am thrilled to welcome all of them here tonight. A very brief word about the National Constitution Center. We are, as I love to say every time I get the chance to greet a group like this, the only institution in the country chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And that means we bring together all sides in the constitutional debates that are riveting the country and let citizens make up their own mind. We do that uh, in three ways. We're the museum of we the people, and we have this beautiful space you see here that shows the inspiring show Freedom Rising. Starting next fall, we're gonna display one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. Pennsylvania's copy of the Bill of Rights, and that combined with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution will be the basis for three years of debate and education about the Bill of Rights and the subsequent amendments that will lead up to the year 2020. We're also America's town hall, and that means we have debates and panels and symposia like this one, which bring together all sides of constitutional debates. And boy, these things are taking off. We have weekly constitutional podcasts on the constitutional issue of the week that bring together the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country. The last one on affirmative action, which you can find on the web, got 30,000 downloads uh, and uh, just is getting a tremendous reaction. So I really think that there's a hunger around this country for constitutional education, and I hope you'll be part of it. And finally, we're a center for civic education, and we are going to create the best interactive constitution on the web with nonpartisan content keyed to the new requirement on the SAT that all students read and analyze the founding documents and the global conversation they have inspired, including the 19th Amendment. So it's now going to be crucial for every high school kid and middle school kids, too, who study in the Common Core to learn about the 19th Amendment and the Bill of Rights and the subsequent amendments, to be able to analyze them critically, and we want to play a crucial role in that effort. So that's the National Constitution Center. I've got a lot to learn tonight, and I'm really excited to begin this conversation. I'm going to introduce our Dream Team panelists quickly so we can jump right in. Nancy Cott, the leading historian of the 19th Amendment in the country, is the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard, uh, where her work on 19th and 20th century US history focuses on gender questions. Neil Siegel is the David W. Eichel Professor of Law and Professor of Political Science at Duke Law School and co-director of the program in public law uh, there as well. And Reva Siegel is the Nicholas D.B. Katzenbach Professor of Law at Yale Law School, my old colleague and friend. I've learned so much from all of these scholars. That little uh, ring reminded me to ask you to turn off your cell phones. 
Um, we will have questions from the audience, and our great town hall team will be handing out note cards about halfway through the program, and you can write down your questions, and we'll pose them to the panel. We're going to start with the history of the 19th Amendment and then talk about its contemporary applications. I want to begin, as is always a great thing to do, with the text. Here's my NCC pocket constitution. We'll give you some free ones uh, if you'd like one on the way out. And here's the text of the 19th Amendment, passed by Congress on June 4th. 1919 and ratified on August 18th, 1920. It says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Nancy Cott, today we think of the 19th Amendment as inevitable. No one's against the celebration of its 100th anniversary. Was it inevitable when it was passed? Well, I, it, the uh, passage of, of the 19th Amendment here in the U.S. was the culmination of an extremely long battle. Over 75 years, women had begun to agitate for the vote back in the 1840s, so it had been a, a very lengthy effort, and it was part of one section of what was an international a push by women in many countries, uh, the, the more advanced industrial countries, to share the vote with men. Uh, so I do think that at some point in the 20th century, women would have gained the vote, as they did everywhere in the industrialized world. But for instance, in France, women didn't vote till 1947. Uh, in Switzerland, it was even later, I believe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in Iceland, women got the vote before American women. So did women in New Zealand. So that, well, in one sense, yes, it was going to happen, but the fact that it happened when it did had everything to do with the kind of coalition women who were moving toward this goal were able to form in the 19-teens. And because of their move from what had been through most of the, uh, the, the decades of struggle, what had been a state-by-state -state approach to gaining the vote, given that under our federal system, the power to, to make people eligible for the vote does rest with the states. So women struggling for the vote had worked state-by-state, -state, and it wasn't until the 19-teens that, first of all, the suffrage movement was a very, very large movement by then. It was, it deserves the name a mass movement by the period of, say, uh, starting just about 100 years ago, by 1914 and through to 1919, uh, which I would not have called it a mass movement before that. But uh, at that point, there was also a move to go the constitutional route. And just, I'm glad you read the text, because I think people often say casually the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. It really did not do that, not in a literal sense. What the 19th Amendment did was prohibit the states from limiting the vote on the basis of sex. And uh, I want to point out the way in which that looks directly back to the Civil War and the huge shift in American society that happened by the ending of slavery and the granting of the vote to freed slaves, to freed male slaves. The, um, the push for the vote by those leaders, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, whose names many people do know today, uh, really came as a result of the 13th Amendment, the amendment that ended slavery. The 13th Amendment was enormously inspiring to Americans who believed in progressive social change because they felt in 1866, 1867, 1868, that if the institution of slavery that had been so pervasive in the American economy and had lasted for more than 200 years, if the Constitution could end something that large, meaningful, and of course exploitative, then what couldn't it do? And in the couple of years after the 13th Amendment, something like 100 amendments were introduced into Congress. One of them was an amendment to prohibit limiting the vote on account of sex. That, uh, of course, most of the 100 weren't passed at all. But at the point at which the 19th Amendment 
came to seem, or a woman suffrage amendment came to seem more realistic, it was then modeled exactly on the 15th Amendment, which had been passed to assure, to try to assure against Southern former slave states resistance that black men could vote. And it's also the model for the amendment that uh, reduced the, the age level for voting that was passed in 1970, I think, 71. Uh, this negative model that the, uh, the states are not allowed to limit voting on account of race, sex, or the age, you know, the certain, uh, the age of 21 was not to be required. Fascinating. So Riva Nancy, in this wonderful introduction, has says that the framers of the 19th Amendment were inspired by the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, the 15th, which granted America, African Americans the right to vote. Was the right to vote the only goal of the framers of the 19th Amendment, or did they have broader goals as well? Uh, well, one way to look at this amendment is as a piece of federal constitutional text. But as Nancy observed, when the move for suffrage starts, it starts at the state level and has a long, many decades life as a, a matter of state reform. And in that time period, the question of what was at stake in enfranchising women could be said to have evolved quite significantly. You could always say, well, what was at stake was the vote. Um, but the question is, why did that, why ever was it reasonable to exclude women from the vote? And what began to move women uh, to seek the vote? What did they argue was at stake? And why did they think that the normal state of affairs should be disrupted and changed? And if you ask the question that way, uh, the subject matter of the suffrage campaign runs well beyond voting to the entire conditions of daily life that might make an ordinary woman conclude that um, a world organized uh, with male suffrage only was not a just world or a safe world or a desirable world and needed to change. And so a conversation about voting began to be connected to many other facets of life. And the facets of life to which voting was connected actually varied with groups of women and over time. So for example, one very important um, expansion of the vote came through the women's temperance uh, movement. Um, the question, let me back up and just start with the world in which it's reasonable to exclude women from the vote. Maybe it's helpful even to start there. So um, today we think about suffrage, uh, excuse me, citizenship as voting. <laughs> we think about voting as the simple basis of what it means to be a citizen, but at the time of the founding and for years and years and years thereafter, voting was actually seen to be a privilege held by some um, and not a right held by all citizens. And you know, we know that African Americans were disfranchised, we know that women were disfranchised, but in fact, uh, the vote followed property for the longest time. And it took a long time before the expansion of the suffrage began to raise questions about who in the end was entitled to speak for the rest of the polity when they voted. And a long entrenched, very int it's sort of reasonable, for, for centuries, a reasonable view of the matter was that men could speak for women, the male head of household could speak for his family. And that's the structure that helps make ordinary reasonable people agree to a world in which women are not given their own direct political voice. So then the question becomes, what might move women <laughs> to challenge um, that order? And some of what moved some women had to do with the law of the family and the kinds of powers that were given to the male head of household uh, relative to other members of the family um, as women began to want to act on their own behalf in matters of sort of economic affairs and otherwise, or wanted simply to be able to assert their voice within the family, within the family economy, um, male prerogative to represent the household came to be seen by some as injury, as affront. For others, um, there was the question of what happened when life did not proceed according to its ideal form. And the question of drink was often that if women were abandoned, or if their husbands were not employed, or if their husbands were taking advantage, or their husbands were abusing, 
the question of um, drinking could stand in for what does a woman need to do on her own behalf when life is not working out the way it should. Um, there come to be other ways in which we women conceive of the harm here, whether it has to do with the dis distribution of property or their ability to vote to protect themselves in the workplace. By the time that the suffrage comes to be a mass movement in the 19-teens, um, the notion of social housekeeping is an important frame for talking about enfranchisement, and that has to do with everything having to do with clean water, um, ability to care for children in school, conditions of women's work, their ability to have a, a, a workplace that felt safe or their a remuneration that felt fair. So you can listen to this story and see how the vote could get symbolically connected to many, many features of social life, many issues of gender justice for women that could evolve depending on one's life situation and over the decorate decades, um, the sort of larger structure of politics. Neil, uh, tell us about the men. So in Riva's riveting history, you have a world of the Married Women Property Acts where mar married women are not allowed to inherit uh, property. They're considered uh, you know, the, the legal subjects of their husbands and so forth. How, did, how were men persuaded to uh, vote for the 19th Amendment? And tell us about the politics of that. Well, there were two main arguments right, um, um, that really were, uh, were presented uh, in opposition. Uh, to women, uh, to women voting, and one had to do with this idea of virtual representation that Riva just spoke to, uh, and virtual representation has uh, a pretty shaky history in this country. Right when uh, the colonists said no taxation without representation, the English Parliament said, "Well, you're represented. You're virtually represented," and that wasn't good enough, right, uh, for the colonists and the men who declared their independence, and yet uh, for a very long time before, during, and after. Uh, the revolution and the separation from England, virtual representation was deemed by men uh, good enough for American women. So that was one argument, virtual representation, and uh, there were increasing uh, ways in which uh, women, depending on their life circumstances, were contesting this idea that, in fact, um, they weren't so well, well, well represented uh, by um, the male uh, breadwinners, uh, their husbands in their family. And then you heard another argument, which is actually in quite a bit of conflict with the virtual representation argument, and this was the idea of marital discord, that if you allow uh, women uh, the vote, that's going to cause discord, uh, dissension uh, within the marriage, and that couldn't be good for anyone. And of course, the solution to that was not to allow women to vote and not men, right? It was to um, just keep allowing men to vote. And so you can see the tension between the arguments, but both were maintained. And I think what you saw uh, over time uh, was uh, these arguments becoming less and less uh, plausible uh, to uh, the men who uh, were in political power, who uh, had the authority right, to vote and to decide whether or not to allow women to vote. And there was also an interesting political dynamic in that uh, once you allowed women to vote on the local level, on the state level, there was an important political sense in which there was no going back. Um, if you advocated for the vote, uh, uh, and you were denied it, well, then you could live to fight another day and advocate, right? But if you advocated for the vote uh, and you prevailed, uh, well, then uh, you have the vote and women are voting and they're not going to vote against their future disenfranchisement, right? So I think part of the political uh, structural dynamics of this was that um, uh, time was, uh, I don't think anything was inevitable. Uh, I think uh, one, of the, one of the themes I'd like to leave you folks with is the importance of history and contingency and struggle uh, and not inevitability, right? Uh, so many things look inevitable from the standpoint of the present. Um, right, there is no group organizing to oppose the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, but for the longest period of time, this was deeply contested, uh, deeply divisive. Uh, and so I think over time, uh, enough men became persuaded by enough women who were pushing and agitating Right, um, um, pushing for change. It didn't just happen because it was inevitable. It happened because right, uh, women advocated and men eventually responded. And I think it also happened because um, it was, uh, you could lose and fight for a future success, whereas if you won, right, it was harder once women had the vote to take it away. Um, it, can I just add to that? One of the features of the fact that the state-by-state state approach had been used was that several states, most of them in the West, 
began to grant women the vote. In part, these Western states were hoping to encourage women to move there, places like Wyoming. Uh, Colorado gave women the vote in the 1890s. So by 1910, let's say, a year when a couple more states added, uh, said women could vote, and by 1911, California did, so that some of the arguments, such as the ones Neil mentioned, that uh, granting women the vote would mean that families would fall apart, there would be so much discord, uh, and there, by 1910, there were places where women had been voting for a couple of decades, and none of those terrible results had happened. So the, the anti-arguments began to lose any power, because there was actual evidence that these horrible results had not occurred. And I, I wanted to pick up on something Reva mentioned, too, about the, the daily life uh, uh, aspects of what the vote uh, seemed to promise to bring, or what women felt it would bring them. A, a lot of this um, was absolutely requisite for the advocacy to become a mass movement. And the way that it did had a great deal to do with the fact that immigration had greatly increased, there was a much expanded working class, and this working class, including the, the unmarried women in it, was being used to, uh, to people factories. And there were terrible industrial conditions. The pro-suffrage advocates argued that the only way to improve conditions for women in industry was for women to have the vote and be able to vote in better laws that would put limits on the hours women could work, the, um, the conditions they could be forced to labor in, et cetera. And this was an important way of bringing um, not only working class women, but working class men into suffrage advocacy. And there were many middle class female reformers, the social housekeepers Reva mentioned, who also felt that the vote, having the power of the vote was the way to bring about a beneficial social reforms for pure milk and food, yes, but also very much for conditions for women in industry. So the move of women into the employed labor force uh, uh, was, uh, was a very important uh, factor that made the suffrage movement a mass movement. And it, it's quite interesting to observe, too, how far, uh, I mean, the vote was a symbol of women's equality for many people fighting for it. It was also, after it was achieved in the 1920s, most people in the younger generation assumed that women were now completely equal and they would have complete access to all the professions, to all the learned fields, all the arenas uh, from which they had been formerly excluded or in which they had been marginalized. Now, as we know, that it wasn't that easy, but it, the vote did represent a great deal more in terms of women's employability, access to education, and uh, higher fields of aspiration in terms of their occupational lives. Reva, take us up from the passage of the 19th Amendment to the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment and the debate in the 1970s. I learned during our discussion before the show that the first ERA was actually introduced in 1923. Who introduced it? Why didn't it pass then? And why wasn't it until the late 60s and 70s that it really got some steam, and what's the relation between the debate over the ERA and the debate over the 19th Ooh. Amendment? Just um, a small question for our, for our next, uh, next uh, round. So I'll, I'll try a, a short version of this. Um, the, text of, the text of the, the 19th Amendment um, refers to uh, the suffrage, and so it actually s talks about the wrongs of excluding on the basis of sex, and the question is, did it concern other forms, areas of social life beyond the suffrage? And there were some who sought to extend the equality principle to other social domains through an equal rights amendment that would make it unlawful to exclude on the basis of sex across other social spheres. This amendment was first introduced a couple years after ratification of the 19th Amendment. And uh, famously, the women's movement divided about whether it was a good thing to pursue an equal rights amendment at that time period because um, many women in the factories were protected through forms of protective labor legislation which 
were articulated not just to protect workers from onerous, from low wages or long hours, but to protect women from, from certain forms of onerous working conditions. Um, why that's so has its own constitutional history, which we could talk about, but I'll short circuit it for now and observe that that was then the structure of the laws. And so for some good number of women who had mobilized for the suffrage, pursuing uh, f what was seen to be formal equality um, by having a non-discrimination principle of the kind that the Equal Rights Amendment articulated was seen as a threat. Um, there are really interesting questions about whether the 19th Amendment, excuse me, the Equal Rights Amendment introduced at that time would have to have been interpreted that way or enforced that way. But just say for purposes of understanding this history, it was seen as if non-discrimination, sex blindness was the principle behind the Equal Rights Amendment and there was division. Could I ask what the text of that 1923 amendment was? It, it, did it look like the one that came up in the 70s? It, it didn't look exactly like the one that was then introduced in uh, 1970. Actually, the, the amendment, it, it, I, as I recall, I believe it just said, men and women shall have equal rights. Wow. It, uh, uh, yeah. And then later, the Equal Rights Amendment that uh, was passed but not ratified was again modeled on the 15th and the 19th, said equality of rights shall not be denied. On account but, of sex. Yeah, on account of sex, yeah. You, yeah. you and Reva were having an interesting discussion yeah. about the coalition yeah. behind that 1923 yeah. amendment. Share that with the, with the group. Well, uh, one of the really striking things about the accomplishment of the vote was the, the kind of coalition that was forged in the 19-teens that that for the first time, very wealthy women got interested in pushing for suffrage, which is great, it funded a lot of campaigning. But a lot of working class women also got interested for their own reasons, as I said. It was the period in which African American women were most active. There'd been a large contingent of African American men and women leaders who had been for granting the vote to women ever since the Civil War, but the, uh, it was particularly became more uh, more of a movement among African Americans in the teens, and uh, even socialists who, in certain ways, said they wouldn't support participation in a non-socialist government, nonetheless were for the vote for women. So it was a very big coalition of people whose interests, in other respects, were quite at odds. And that was, I would say, because the vote was really a tool. It was a tool that people could have to express their views for perhaps divergent goals. That is, those who supported sex-differentiated labor laws could use the vote to vote for elected officials who would support sex-differentiated labor laws. Those who thought, no, we shouldn't have laws that say, well, women can't carry 40 pounds at work, whereas men can. And they said, just let everybody go at it with the same equal playing field. They could use the vote for that purpose. So that it, the vote was a, a, I think, unique sort of a potentiating tool and was able to gather a coalition uh, of people whose other interests conflicted. When, when the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed, it, um, it was interpreted Andrew, by... Can I just sure, say one thing? Sure. People should understand as a background fact that um, uh, women as a group are obviously members of yeah. other social groups. Right. And so it's always an historically contingent fact when they understand themselves qua women and when they understand mm. themselves predominantly in yes. light of their other religious, ethnic, racial, class, whatever identities. But what you need to understand to understand this particular dispute is that the Supreme Court in the early 20th century um, adopted an understanding of the Constitution that made it very hard to, adopt, to enact labor protective la legislation, but then carved an exception for sex-based labor legislation, mm. the Lochner and the Mueller cases. And so there was uh, protection for women workers that was all articulated in sex-based terms. Yeah. And was not at that time then possible to enact it in a sex neutral sort of way. And so when the ERA came up, it threatened that labor protective legislation, which but for the background Supreme Court cases 
wouldn't necessarily have been shaped in that form. I just Absolutely. wanted to no, give No, that's the very, very clarifying. So I, just to cut to the chase here, the point is that equality of rights sounds more cut and dried than equal voting rights, which, again, gives everyone the same tool to use to their particular interests. And, and so the coalition that had been forged fell apart. So this is fascinating, and Riva and Nancy have been talking about the beginning of the split between uh, uh, different visions of feminism, and these decisions they're referring to said, you uh, can't pass um, maximum hour and minimum wage limitations for men, because men don't need special protections, but you can for women, because women are weaker, and they have to have special uh, you know, solicitude of the law. So this paternalistic vision for upholding these progressive laws divided the movement in the way they describe. Now, Neil, tell us about how this uh, division played out in the debate over the ERA in the 1970s. Uh, the ERA is introduced in Congress, it's moving along in the states, and the Supreme Court sweeps down and kind of enacts the ERA by judicial fiat in the Frontiero case in 1973, and some uh, people, uh, some historians have argued that this took the wind out of the sails of the ERA, and it was not ratified because the Supreme Court tried to impose it uh, ahead of schedule. Tell us about that history and whether the Supreme Court was going ahead of popular opinion or tracking it. Yeah, I, I don't think I would describe it as the Supreme Court uh, via judicial fiat uh, imposed the ERA, right? I think that, that the kind of framing assumes the conclusion that the Supreme Court did, right, what you asked about. Um, in uh, 1971, uh, the uh, uh, very recent history is the first time in American history uh, the Supreme Court strikes down a sex classification as, as violating uh, the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, 1971 is it's, uh, the year I was born. Very recent, very recent history. Uh, 1973. Don't rub it in. Uh, in the uh, in in the Frontiero case, right? You have four justices um, talking about uh, the history, uh, the history uh, of sex discrimination that women have endured in this country. Unfortunately, Justice Brennan not really emphasizing uh, uh, the framing and ratification of the 19th Amendment and the decades of social movement conflict over that. Four justices in Frontiero uh, say that uh, sex classifications, uh, facial distinctions based on sex should trigger uh, what's called strict scrutiny, the most demanding level of judicial review uh, known to constitutional law, where laws are presumed unconstitutional and governments have to have really compelling reasons to impose, uh, to impose a sex-based uh, distinction. Uh, there isn't a fifth vote in Frontiero, and some of the law about the court is that uh, there was a holdout uh, thinking that the ERA at that point would be, uh, would be ratified. Uh, and in, a few years later, in 1976, uh, the court, uh, in a case called Craig against Boren, settles upon intermediate scrutiny, something between deferential judicial review and very demanding judicial review, uh, and a case involving, uh, unfortunately, from my point of view, watered-down beer. Uh, this was a case in which men had access uh, women had access to watered-down beer in Oklahoma at 18, and men had to wait until 21, and that was the case in which um, the court declared that sex classification should trigger skeptical scrutiny. And I think a court uh, that was more attentive to um, uh, the 19th Amendment uh, and uh, the debates over the 19th Amendment and um, what, what it meant uh, to give women the vote and why there was so much opposition to giving women the vote uh, the idea that women as economically dependent caregivers as opposed to uh, breadwinners who participate in the public life of the nation, right? They didn't really need uh, the vote. I think a court in 1976 that had been more attentive to that might have picked a different vehicle. They might have focused on something like discrimination against pregnant women uh, as opposed to watered down uh, beer and they might have reasoned not just by analogy from racial, uh, racial discrimination but actually from uh, the kinds of sex equality uh, norms that move people to fight for uh, the vote for women. I think it might have shaped the court's doctrine differently. Now, I haven't yet gotten to the, the question you asked, but Reva, I, I see you want to intervene. I just wanted to, I thought this audience might find it interesting uh, to hear just a little bit, snippet more from the early 1970s. Um, uh, so we're describing, Neil is describing, um, that uh, the court shifted in the way that it was interpreting the Equal Protection Clause, and for the first time uh, since its, uh, the 14th Amendment's ratification, 
in the aftermath of the Civil War, the court began to say, ah, distinctions on the basis of sex violate equal protection. But courts don't come to wisdom of this kind out of the blue. And the court, in interpreting the Constitution's text differently, was doing so at a time when there was enormous uh, and increasing popular interest in issues of, of sex equality in the early 1970s and a move, a genuine move, to press for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment among them. But what I wanted to observe on the story of the 19th Amendment was that um, 1970 was the 50th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And uh, the women's movement helped kick off the fight for the modern fight for the Equal Rights Amendment by essentially mobilizing on the anniversary of the 50th anniversary of the amendment's ratification, talking about the ways in which uh, the suffrage amendment gave women equal voting rights, but not full equal citizenship. And so using the memory of ratification to raise a series of issues which the movement then in 1970 saw as necessary to secure genuine equality of citizenship for women. And what the movement then put on the table, that is in 1970, during the Women's Strike for Equality on August 26, 1970, was ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment and then these three uh, demands or talking points that came up every place that the celebration of the 19th Amendment's ratification was marked. Um, and they were equal employment opportunity, equal uh, so access to abortion rights, which were then still criminalized, and uh, national uh, provision of child care services uh, so that the idea was that uh, you wouldn't have full equality for women unless and until you altered the conditions on which they conceived and, and raised the children. That that was as much a part of the meaning of equal citizenship for women as was uh, voting itself proper. So I thought that that story of this 50 years ago anniversary um, I mean, 50, the 50th anniversary would be an interesting piece of this story. But can I could just add very briefly? Sure. I don't think it's the Supreme Court that got out in front of the country, right, that had the perverse effect of causing the ERA to be defeated. I think there's a very powerful and effective counter mobilization, right, led by Phyllis Shafley, uh, saying that if you pass the ERA, it's going to mean the end of any and all the sex distinctions in the country, right? It's going to mean um, the end of sex segregated bathrooms, um, what Justice Ginsburg called the potty issue, um, right? It's going to mean all kinds of things um, um, that I think um, persuaded enough people. I mean, you had super majoritarian support in the country for ERA. You just didn't have super duper majoritarian support in the end, which is what you need to ratify our Constitution. It's extraordinarily difficult to do. I want to return to contemporary constitutional implications of the 19th Amendment in a moment, but Nancy, uh, Justice Ginsburg spoke at a wonderful National Constitution Center event in DC last week, and with riveting precision was telling the story about how she litigated the gender equality cases of the 1970s, first of all by often representing male plaintiffs who were discriminated against by laws that favored uh, female child uh, givers, but not male ones, because she thought that would appeal to judges. Um, to what degree was the, uh, the legal victories of the 1970s, how much do they draw on the lessons of the 19th Amendment in focusing on political mobilization, and how much do they focus on winning the victories through the courts? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the two were, were very much in, in synergy. As Riva was suggesting, the advances that seemed to come very rapidly in the courts were ineffably but definitely responding to the shift in social values and they were responding to the pressures of a very vociferous women's movement. So that I, I don't think you can fully untangle those, those things. But I was very glad Reva mentioned those three demands of the women's strike for equality in 1970 given that we really haven't achieved them all fully yet 50 years later. Well, um, let us uh, focus on the constitutional applications today. So I began by saying some of the most exciting work in constitutional law today uh, is being done by Riva and Neil and Nancy to argue that the 19th Amendment should be interpreted not simply as a guarantee of 
the right to vote, but a guarantee of gender equality more broadly. And Riva, you've written the definitive article saying that restrictions on the right, uh, rights of reproductive choice should be viewed not only as a violation of the right to privacy, but as a violation of rights of gender equality. To what degree might the 19th Amendment play a role in arguing for a right to choose uh, reproductive freedom? Um, so, I guess the core issue here has to do with, I guess the core issue here has to do with the question of whether um, women have uh, control a voice in the conditions of, over which they become mothers. And uh, the issue can certainly be understood as a liberty or a privacy issue, but I've also argued, this is an also, not an alternatively, also argued that it needs to be understood in uh, terms of gender equality. That is, uh, that there are certain forms of coercion in this sphere that uh, carry forward the long tradition that we're talking about here in ways that are inconsistent with guarantees of equal citizenship today. There's sort of a choice of self-government, if you will, a choice uh, to, to make family life uh, as a matter, a sphere of uh, 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 equal participation and equal voice. And um, interesting question whether and to what extent this has anything to do with the 19th Amendment. I just told you a story about 1970 in which um, when the women's movement in the early 1970s was beginning to speak about equal citizenship, they uh, articulated uh, the importance of uh, making equality mean in respect of family life. Not just uh, the idea of avoiding family, but very, very much a question of what it would mean to participate as a family member in spheres of citizenship, whether it be politics, education, or work. So that's the childcare piece of this. I mean, I think it's totally fascinating to look at these two together, freedom to as well as freedom from. And um, at that time, the 19th Amendment was what it remains today, the sole piece of constitutional text that articulated uh, a gender equality norm expressly on its face. We certainly can talk about the meaning of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, but on account of sex is the language of the 19th Amendment. And so uh, there was this nexus in the 1970s. Um, I can also report to you that in the period before the court began to extend the Equal Protection Clause guarantees to women, to protect them against sex discrimination in that early 1970s period that there were uh, advocates who invoked the 19th Amendment amongst other pieces of constitutional text when they were talking about reproductive autonomy. There in, in Connecticut, uh, the litigation challenging a law that criminalized abortion uh, with uh, only, I think, an exception for a woman's life um, the first opinion striking down that law also invoked um, the 19th Amendment as well as Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act as grounds for understanding the equality norm. Um, today, we don't think about the 19th Amendment because when people talk about equal citizenship for women, they speak in terms of the Equal Protection Clause and that's understandable. What the 19th Amendment does is tell us that in fights over uh, women's equal citizenship, the way they do their family lives has played a central and continuing role. And so that, I think, is an important feature of how the 19th Amendment orients the story. Neil, you too have been done path-breaking work on arguing that the 19th Amendment should be at the center of rethinking some of our current constitutional doctrine. Tell us about how a 19th Amendment argument might support a right to choose contraception, for example. Also tell us the arguments on the other side, because I want the audience to get a sense of, uh, of both sides. And have courts been sympathetic to this, to, to your arguments and Rivas? Has any court cited the 19th Amendment in rethinking these questions of reproductive choice? Well, that last question is easy. As far as I know, the answer is no. I don't think. I think one, one, di one district court opinion may be from early 1970s, but yeah, certainly I, not a norm. Right. I thought you meant, say, um, last 20 years. or. Uh, I, I, guess, I just want to be clear about what the claim is. The claim is not, uh, if you just look at the 19th Amendment, Section 1, um, what you see there is 
right, a full-throated sex equality norm. Uh, it's as if uh, all you need is the 19th Amendment and look, take it seriously, and the ERA has already been ratified, we just didn't know it, right? That's not, that's not the claim, right? I mean, the text is focused on voting, and it's focused on non-discrimination with respect to voting. I think the claim is that once you agree that the Equal Protection Clause of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment protects women too, right? Uh, the prohibition on states denying persons within their jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, that women are persons too, and um, right, Justice Scalia right, still, uh, still contests that uh, in various ways, but, but that, is, right, that is a deeply embedded constitutional norm. Uh, you're not gonna be taken, well, uh, you're, not, you're very unlikely to get confirmed Right, if you say at a Supreme Court confirmation hearing that you don't think the Equal Protection Clause applies to women. I mean, Judge Bork right, um, um, said that and, and he, did not get, he did not get confirmed. No conservative nominee today comes anywhere close to saying that. Um, that's, I think, how embedded the norm is. So once you agree that the Equal Protection Clause protects women too, the question is what kind of sex, equal what kind of sex equality does it have to offer? What does sex equality mean? And I think the claim is that the 19th Amendment and the history out of which it emerged is relevant to that understanding. Is sex equality just about classifications, distinctions based on in sex? In your case, give right? the example right. of the men, case. Right, the men, can get, uh, the men can't get the beer until 21 and the women can get it at 18? Or is it about uh, the effects, uh, the social meanings of different forms of government regulation, uh, the gendered impacts uh, as well as forms of government action that reflect or reinforce the very kinds of traditional sex role stereotypes that made it so reasonable for so long for women to be denied the vote. If you imagine women as destined to be wife and mother, which is the way the court used to put it, as economically dependent caregivers, then it's not at all intuitive why contraception would be uh, a very important constitutional right. Right? Women are supposed to be bearing children and raising them within the home depending on their husbands for subsistence as well as representation in the outside world. But if you understand right, that this claim about virtual representation, this claim about men are destined for a certain sphere and women are destined for another, that that is defeated when the 19th Amendment is framed and ratified, uh, then that seems to have implications for how we understand sex equality today. It's not just narrow distinctions or classifications based on sex. It's about, um, it's about firing a pregnant woman from work, right? Um, and, and not being satisfied to say, well, that's just discrimination against a pregnant person. That's not sex discrimination, right? It's about reproductive choice, uh, uh, as Riva talked about it, which is not to say that reproductive choice is only about sex equality, right? Uh, it's about that it's also about sex equality. There are utterly good faith arguments uh, for uh, desires to protect fetal life, right? But, but if it was just about that, then you'd see a lot more uh, support right, uh, for pregnant women and for mothers than we see in this country. It wouldn't seem like the costs of coerced childbirth are just modest in size and private in nature. It's only because we imagine that it's the natural destiny of women uh, to become mothers anyway that we can rationalize coercing childbirth uh, while denying the kind of social and material support that pregnant women and mothers need uh, in, order to, in order to raise their children and have a life outside the home, and so too, I think, with, with contraception. The Griswold case, and we're, we're, we're quickly coming to the 50th anniversary, uh, the Griswold case, which protected a right of uh, married couples to contraception, and then extended a few years later to all individuals, uh, this was before the court understands the abortion right, uh, decades before the court understands the abortion right as a sex equality right. Uh, part of what Reeve and I have been talking about lately is imagining this contraception right, which is defended as a liberty right, as an autonomy right, is also a sex equality right. That is absolutely essential uh, for women to have access, safe, effective, affordable access to contraception if they're going to be able to, to control the timing of motherhood right, and do uh, so much more in the world than women were expected to do at the time it seemed utterly reasonable to deny them the vote. Great. Well, uh, we have a group of superb questions from the audience, and I'm going to jump right in. Uh, the first is, what relationship did race play in the framing of suffrage? Nancy. Well, in the framing, it, it had little role. In the movement, I would say there were tremendous conflicts between uh, white women about how far they might um, 
foreground and integrate black women into their struggle. Uh, it was rather a nasty business, I would say, in that, um, as I mentioned briefly, both African-American men and women, the leading figures, uh, the leading intellectuals and political thinkers had actually been in favor of suffrage for women. Um, and in the context of general disenfranchisement of black men in the South, where 90% of blacks lived, that was um, a, a bold and courageous step to take. Uh, at, at the time of fighting state by state, however, white women who led the fight in southern states were completely against admitting black women to their struggle. They felt that their strongest argument was that white women, if enfranchised, would outvote all African Americans. So there was a deep racist streak in particularly southern women's strategies to gain the suffrage. However, that was not universal in the movement. And uh, in New York, for instance, in New York State, there was some integration of the struggle, but it was generally a, a very bitter, um, a, uh, bitter experience for African-American women who were genuinely for the vote for themselves and all women and who found themselves marginalized uh, in the movement um, with a, only a very few exceptions. Uh, would proponents of the 19th Amendment be happy with the current status of women or would they be frustrated with the lack of real equality? Riva. Well, um, I guess I would say that um, with any uh, with any of these kind of questions, it all depends. There are uh, the fact that we're at a, a juncture where it's imaginable, at least, that a woman could serve as president of the United States certainly does represent a change over the history that we've been talking about here. And so in that respect, you could say that we've seen uh, dramatic shifts in the political participation and leadership um, possibilities of women over the time period in question. The idea that um, there are 20 women senators now, I mean, that represents a shift that is dramatic, profound. It nonetheless remains the case that um, the traditions that we're talking about persist. And you could say it's great that there are 20 women senators. On the other hand, the proportions are certainly- Why are there 50 women? Exactly, right? So, so you, know, you could flip that. You can see, is the glass half full, half empty? You can see either dramatic change or persistence of uh, the same story that we've been talking about. And um, I do think, and I'll just say this simply, that um, uh, inequality is a lively thing. <laughs> it changes shape over time. And so you can have a world that locks people in places of exclusion and subordination, a movement for challenging those arrangements, dramatic shifts, and still wind up with a world in which there's palpable differences of status and position between groups in justified in new ways and in new forms. And I would say that's the world we're still in today. So. What does it say about the Constitution's text that a sex equality amendment is today a political non-starter, Neil? Uh, I think it. I think it says something. Uh, I think it says something about the work that remains to be done, uh, and and the half-empty part of what uh, Riva just said. I also think it. Um, it says something about um, uh, unrealized or un insufficiently argued possibilities uh, for those who uh, very much believe, uh, very much believe uh, in, in, in sex equality in a very uh, robust, substantive uh, way. Um, uh, there's a story that uh, Justice Ginsburg likes to tell when she's asked what part of the Constitution would she change if she could, and she says how she would, uh, she, she'd want the Equal Rights Amendment to be ratified uh, she'd like her grandchildren to be able to stare at the Constitution and see explicitly uh, what is actually there today um, more implicitly. And I think there's a, you know, I'd like to see uh, the ERA ratified too. Um, I, and I think there's truth to what she's saying, but I also think that that's, the, the, I think that that, uh, that kind of statement um, uh, has a tendency to render the 19th Amendment uh, invisible. Right, there is a very important sex equality norm there in the text, and I think 
um, uh, there's if we if if we focused more on it and saw the interpretive possibilities uh, that it provides, um, I think you'd see um, I think you'd see uh, a, a more robust understanding of sex equality under the Equal Protection Clause as well as uh, uh, the Due Process Clause than uh, than we have so far. I just want to add one thing, which is that um, women are half the world, and uh, we're divided about what we think equal justice for women looks like and what the good society looks like and what our constitutional order ought to look like. And um, the fact that it's not possible to come to an agreement about these matters seems to be more likely than not. And so uh, the fact that we couldn't just simply come to an agreement about what the Constitution ought to say and mean and be done with it strikes me as a healthy state of affairs in this society. We're debating exactly what it is that government can do for families and with families. And some of these things are so rudimentary that they actually ought to be ground norms of our constitutional orders. And others respects, they're great questions for us to argue with one another about in politics. And I think that's a healthy state of affairs. Uh, could you tell us about the woman who ran for president in the 1800s, Nancy? Well, Victoria Woodhull is usually a considered the first woman to run for president. In 1872, she did uh, form a party and, uh, and run. She was a, a very extraordinary character who came from very poor background, be, was quite an entrepreneur, actually ran a brokerage house on Wall Street with her sister, ran a, a newspaper of her own, and um, her running for president is only a very small part of what she did, as a matter of fact, and it wasn't a long campaign. She became later a spiritualist and a believer, an advocate for free love, and then later moved to England and became a Catholic. So uh, she, <laughs> she had quite a wild ride of her life. There, uh, there's a great book on her. What would you recommend for the group? Because it's fun to, to read uh, uh, about. There are a few books on her, so I don't know which one you have in mind. Or uh, we'll uh, we'll yeah. send out a reading list afterward. But she's definitely yes. worth uh, uh, checking out. Our time here. Uh, we've got just I think two more questions, and then we're going to uh, wrap up. Uh, can workplace equality be achieved in a meaningful sense without legislation for adequate maternity and paternity leave, Riva? Uh, well, it certainly is the case that uh, among Western industrialized nations, we do less uh, to mediate or organize, sort of mediate work family conflicts than, say, for example, European nations do. And it does seem fairly uh, primitive or rudimentary that if we're going to make headway, we need to do more and do better than we have. But again, there are really interesting questions about the path to, do, to doing all of that. To what extent does the national government um, really move in some important way to uh, impose requirements on employers? Watching our national conversation around health care, I could see that there might be some difficulties in going that route. Uh, but the notion that we need some basket of menu, a menu of options, public and private, to make uh, seriously uh, to impose, in some sense, some forms of accommodation in the structure of work seems to me just an obvious thing. And the more change there is in family structure, the more this is going to mean something for men as well as women. It's not just a woman's question. And I, and I would say, uh, please, no just maternity leave, right? Maternity leave only, as opposed to parental leave, if, um, if you want to avoid perverse incentives not to hire and promote women, right? Justice, yes. Chief well, Justice the, Rehnquist wrote an opinion suggesting that having only patern maternity leave would actually violate equal protection. That's the yeah. Hibbs case. It's the and the, the FMLA case. pertains to both uh, men and women. For right, just, so for just this have, reason. Yeah, we have, we have national uh, uh, legislation that secures unpaid, unpaid leave, leave yeah. for employers of a certain size for certain grounds, and certainly including early child care leave. But it, as anyone who has a job knows, it does not wholly answer the question. And the question is, what are other ways that government, local and national, 
uh, can uh, move to nudge employers uh, to change practices in a way that's more family friendly. Well, you know, I think my last question is going to be for some advice, uh, and that is this to each of the panelists. How can the National Constitution Center and Vision 2020 best celebrate the anniversary of the 19th Amendment in the years leading up to 2020? Nancy. Start a movement again for all of these unfinished goals. And I would say to, um, to I, I just talked in too realistic a way about the work family boundary. To pursue questions that are as disruptive, transformative, and utopian in our day as the vote for women once was in the mid 19th century. So. And Neil, last word to you. Well, there's a lot of talk about our Constitution in this country. Um, the Constitution in politics often seems to be coextensive uh, with whatever the speaker really likes or really hates. Uh, and I think uh, there's a, a, a lack of and a real need for um, historically informed, um, even-handed, thoughtful, civil, ci civic discourse about the Constitution. And um, I'm, uh, you didn't pay me to say this, but when I think of groups like the National Constitution Center, I think about that kind of discourse. And so I would say uh, more, uh, more events like this um, um, more events in which um, all right, a variety of speakers with different points of view get together and talk about the Ninth Amendment, Nineteenth Amendment, talk about uh, sex equality, uh, talk about um, abortion, talk about contraception, um, and uh, do it in a way that um, I think brings uh, many different kinds of people together. Because uh, one thing I've learned in my own life uh, is that fighting for sex equality is not women's work. Well, I know that uh, Lynn and I are going to follow your advice and try to convene panels and exhibits and discussions as thoughtful as this one, but this is going to be a tough act to follow. You have been the gold standard and the dream team. Thank you, Reva, Nancy, and Neil. We are going to have a reception in a moment, but I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn for some concluding thoughts and some more uh, introductions. Thank you to this wonderful panel. And I just said to Neil that he won my prize with his final line, that uh, this is not just women's work. Um, and so this was a wonderful way for us to uh, lay the groundwork for what we want to just tell you very briefly about what's coming. First of all, I want to just say specifically for anybody who doesn't know, Vision 2020 is a national coalition of individuals and organizations united in the commitment to achieve women's economic and social equality. That's what it is. Uh, we have a national campaign for equality, and it was interesting to me to hear several th comments made that um, women uh, have getting the right to vote was not inevitable, and I don't think the solution to a lot of the issues that we're dealing with is inevitable, like closing the pay gap, for example. Um, another comment was that we assumed uh, that, that people assumed that women were equal once the vote was um, granted, and that clearly uh, has not been the case. And then the other comment was that th there's a lot of work that remains to be done. So um, Rosemary and I want to just tell you a little bit about what we're planning for the year 2020. And, um, and we have a couple of people we want you to meet. And we, in fact, we want you to meet all of our incredible Vil Vision 2020 family that's in town. So the delegates are from across the country. Every state in the union has um, representation either here or in process. Our allies are incredible allies organizations 
the names of which you have known forever are aligned with what we are intent upon doing, the intellect and the, and the scholarly research and the perception of the people seated here in front of us not only should inform us, which it did, obviously, tonight. I don't know about any of you, but did you feel like you were back in college? <laughs> yeah. But not only inform us, but incite us. Not inspire us, but incite us to take the 19th Amendment, the proxy that it was for the hopes and the aspirations and the vision of the suffragists into the future so that when we look at women in the world of work, when we look at women in the world of government or sports or art, home, community, that we are not always looking for and counting the extraordinary. The extraordinary being the percentage of women in elected office the percentage of women who sit on corporate boards, the percentage of women who are in the top 1% of economic measures. Our pursuit should be that the extraordinary becomes ordinary, ordinary. Imagine your parents telling you to aspire to be ordinary, but in fact, equality, Equality should be the definition of ordinary. And we are still in pursuit of that. So being informed, being incited, is also about being excited for the year 2020. In the year 2020, we are planning to have in Philadelphia the largest assembly of women ever in the United States of America. We will have men, women, boys and girls, and women come from every state in the union and maybe even beyond the borders of our country. We will march yet again. If you think the Broad Street Run has, uh, has an assemblage of a great number, 40,000, I think, uh, on Sunday, we will march in celebration and probably still in pursuit of full equality. We talk about Vision 2020 because the suffragists did not have, in their view, simply the right to vote. As we heard tonight, as it was informed and affirmed tonight, it was about full citizenship, full, full equality. And we have not yet realized it. But what we will do in 2020 is celebrate where we are and where we're going. And that celebration is going to entail events all across the country, which our delegates we know will sponsor. It will also include in this city, obviously, as we often hear it referred to, the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection there's quite a distinction between love and affection, isn't there? Yes, and so there is a distinction, too, between men and women, and unfortunately, under the, the, the umbrella of equality. We will make that be different by the year 2020 and then beyond. But when we get to 2020, as part of that march, as part of that celebration, we will celebrate women of courage in every socioeconomic sector in every discipline, in every, every art and culture and every experience of humanity. Speaking of arts and culture, one of the things that we are going to do under the guidance of our centennial committee, and you heard tonight that the mayor is going to be um, honorary chair and we're in pursuit of some other honorary chairs, but one of the things we're going to do is to celebrate women in the arts, in music, in film, in every sector of arts and culture, in everything that lifts up our spirit and makes our souls soar. And we will engage, as part of our centennial committee, 
the Parkway in Philadelphia, the Avenue of the Arts in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, one of our centennial uh, committee members is here tonight. Anne yours, Anne. Anne is CEO of the Kimball Center. And um, why don't you say something about it? Thank you, Rosemary. And I think you'll be thrilled to know that since its inception, the Kimball Center has been led by women. And I'm honored to be one of them. And Leslie Ann Miller is down in front of me, who also led the Kimball Center. So for 2020, the Kimmel Center campus, and, and by that I mean the Academy of Music, the Miriam Theater, and of course the Kimmel Center itself, will be the center of celebration of the talented and very diverse American women who really shaped our arts uh, since the inception and since the birth of this, of this country. And we're just in the very early stages of that planning, but it'll be very exciting, I promise you. We have some other uh, members of our advisory committee. Uh, Cecilia Fitzgibbon is here, the president of Moore College of Art, still a women's college. Yeah. <laughs> and we will take advantage of the 30 or so other universities in and around Philadelphia for putting on and, and pulling out the symposia of ideas and innovation. It will be big because it should be big. And it will be big because it's that important. So, just, um, you met the mayor a little earlier and heard his commitment to this. We have with us also a representative of Governor Corbett, the Secretary of the Commonwealth, Carol Achill, and I'd like her to say a few words. Because we need the state with us too. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I am, it's an extraordinary privilege for me to be here with Lynn Yackel, who ran a campaign in 1992 that came within this much of unseating a long-term incumbent. Give this woman a hand. She has courage uh, and a great campaign. And then there's uh, Rosemary Greco, and I didn't know Rosemary from the business community, but I met her at a summit at Westchester University. We organized a women's summit in 2000, 2001, and the title of the summit was uh, Women Leading in the 21st Century, Lifting as We Climb. And I'm always reminded of Rosemary's remarks that day. They were extraordinary, like the woman she is. So it's a privilege for me to be here with these two outstanding Philadelphians. Thank you. I brought, I brought with me a citation from Governor Corbett and am here to wish you well uh, on his behalf. I had the Department of State and I have to say, it's an enlightened State Department because we've had women secretaries of the Commonwealth since the days of C. Dolores Tucker, who was also a Philadelphian. Uh, and I was intrigued by your discussion today about uh, from suffrage to equality in the workplace. And we do still have a long way to go. One of the most enjoyable things I do as Secretary of the Commonwealth is encourage students, seniors in high school, to vote. And I've been out on the road doing a number of these events. And I will tell you, I speak specifically to the young women at these events and remind them that their great-grandmothers did not have this uh, right and that it is important for them to register and to participate in the process. Looking around this group, I'm a baby boomer, and uh, I think there are a few other baby boomers who are here with us. Uh, we didn't pass through the 60s. We lived the 60s. Uh, Betty Friedan, it has been said that Betty Friedan wrote my life story when I was in fourth grade. Uh, I remember Bella Abzug. How many remember Bella Abzug? Good. <laughs> Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem igniting the women's movement in 1968. I have one daughter who is 37, actually her birthday is today. Um, and my message to her from the time she was little is that 
I may have had to put up with some inequality uh, growing up as I did, but it was always my intent that she would have to put up with much less. Um, we, are, we have come a long way, as the uh, old commercial used to say, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, I'm very impressed with what this organization stands for. It's important to me. It's important to my daughter. It's important to the governor. The governor's cabinet uh, in this era has seven women cabinet members, and I can say uh, we were meeting in the ladies' room right from the beginning, and any other place uh, we could meet because uh, we work as a unit, and uh, I think the governor knows that. He's often curious about what we discuss when he's not present. Uh, the governor has an outstanding woman, chief of staff, and he's also led in the executive office uh, with a policy and program leader who is a woman, a legislative secretary who is a woman, and a uh, press person who's a woman. So in some ways, in my own personal little way, I made it so that there were women leading in the Corbett administration in the 21st century. I intend to grow on those numbers. So I have a uh, citation that is short that I'm going to present to these two outstanding women. Thank you, Carol. Uh, it is my pleasure to join with the Vision 2020 Equality Insight and the Drexel University College of Medicine's Institute for Women's Health and Leadership to welcome everyone gathered here for the Generation of Action, Vision 2020, fourth National Congress event in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since its inception, Vision 2020 has been dedicated to promoting women's equality in the United States and empowering women to become leaders and active members in the political process and in their communities. I commend all those associated with the initiative for their commitment to helping women achieve professional excellence and social equality. It is my hope that Vision 2020 will continue to have a positive impact on our Commonwealth and our nation for years to come. As governor and on behalf of all Pennsylvanians, I'm pleased to welcome everyone gathered for this for the Generations of Action Vision 2020 Fourth National Congress Conference. Please accept my best wishes for a successful and memorable event and for continued success in the future. Signed, Tom Corbett, Governor, May 4th. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Here, we'll put it right here. Thank you. Thanks so much. You. Thanks so much. It's good to see you. Hey. So, um, just since they've all just been officially welcomed by the governor, I'd love to ask the delegates and allies, the Vision 2020 family, to please stand and just so everybody can see you all. You're an amazing group and you're from all over everywhere. <laughs> These are women leaders from all over the United States. And one of those women leaders is, uh, was introduced by the mayor, but I wanted her to just say a few little words here. Desiree Peterkin Bell, who is the city representative, is going to just say a couple words about why Philadelphia, and then we're going to wrap this up so you all can all go enjoy the reception. Yes, I will be very, very quick, but welcome to Philadelphia. <laughs> Lynn and Rosemary, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, my name is Desiree Peter Bell. I'm the Director of Communications for the Mayor and the City Representative, and I'm so excited to be a delegate. I say this often, and I say it loud and proud. I uh, drink deeply from wells I did not dig. There are many, many, many women who have come before me so that I can sit at the table, be in the room, and I don't have to knock the door down. Uh, and I recognize that, although sometimes I still do have to knock the door down, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and so there was power in that. And then, uh, you know, earlier today, I spent a lot of time making a major announcement uh, for Wow Wow Welcome America. I'm also the executive director of that, the largest free outdoor concert in the nation in Philadelphia. So we do big things well here in Philly, and it will continue in 2020. So while you're here, take some time, enjoy the restaurants, shop, <laughs> spend some money. <laughs> but also remember why you're here. You are powerful beyond belief. 
And, you know, I know we have many different kinds of women here from all different sorts of backgrounds. I do this because of my daughter. My daughter's five and a half years old, going on 22. Um, and so I took her to the White House for the first time, and she said to me, Mommy, I want to be the president. And what's interesting is that's kind of a real thing, right? Now, she won't be the first female president, uh, but she can say it, and I can actually help her with that feeling, with that belief, and I don't think it's anywhere impossible at all. Uh, and so those are the conversations that we'll continue to have. But welcome to Philadelphia. Have fun, and thank you for being here. 2020. Thank you, Desiree. <laughs> thank you, Desiree. Thank you so much. That kind of energy is what we are seeing from all of our delegates from all over the country and our allied organizations who are just wonderful. I want to say a thank you to all of our sponsors, but in particular, I want to acknowledge the absolutely crucial role that the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company has paid in Vision 2020's first five years. And I would like to ask Eileen McDonnell, who is the President, Chairman, and CEO of the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Company, to please stand up. And Denise Flannery, who I think, is Denise with you? Is she not here? Okay. Thank you, Eileen. Eileen invested in Vision 2020 when it was just an idea, and I mean that literally. Mm -hmm. And it's made an enormous difference in our getting from where we started to where we are today. One other person I want to salute is Suzanne Svizzini, who is an executive vice president with Wells Fargo, which is the founding supporter of our education initiative. So finally, just to wrap this up, we have 1,965 days until the year 2020, in case you hadn't counted. And we've got many things to do between now and then, because our goal is to achieve 50-50 by 2020. Anything short of that, it would not be equality in key government positions and also in business uh, and, and corporate boards. Um, we are working hard with wonderful allied organizations to move in that, those directions. We have a long way to go, but we've also got six years. Um, we also are, we, are, we have a goal of closing the, the gender pay gap, and I really believe we'll do that by the year 2020. We're educating young people to be civically engaged to um, be, take their responsibilities seriously and to share leadership among women and men. And finally, we are working to educate, register, educate, and mobilize women voters. And so our goal is to have 100% of eligible women voters vote in the 2020 federal elections. That is not a modest goal, it is doable. So 100% turnout seems to me to be a, a, the best gift we could possibly give to Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, uh, and of course, Alice Paul. Um, between now and then, Vision 2020 will be traveling around the country and holding regional conferences, and I'm going to announce where the first one is going to be. Um, we, uh, you probably know this story, but if you don't know it, you should, and that is that the 34th state to ratify the 19th Amendment, the last state required out of the then 48 states, was Tennessee. And it was a young man named Harry Burns who switched his vote when he got a note from his mother that told him to do the right thing. <laughs> True story. So next year, in October of 2015, the state of Tennessee will be dedicating, what? 36. Oh, 36. Yikes. Bad math. Sorry. Um, the That's state why you have a banker as your yeah, co-chair. Right. <laughs> right. The state of Tennessee will be dedicating a suffrage memorial, and we will be holding Vision 2020's fifth national congress in Nashville in late October in connection with the Tennessee Economic Summit for Women. So Tennessee, do your thing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. So, Rosemary, you want to So, just we will make in. some Philadelphia music now. You will begin to hear the strains of our famous and sometimes infamous mummers. So please join us, follow the music to the Delegates Cafe. And thank you, thank you. And the reception that's hosted by BlackRock, which we want to say a thank you to also. Yes.